Neil Gaiman's Norse Mythology, Chapter 7, Loki's Children. Loki was handsome, and he knew it. People wanted to like him. They wanted to believe him, but he was undependable and self-centered at best, mischievous or evil at worst. He married a woman named Sigyn, who had been happy and beautiful when Loki courted and married her, but now always looked like she was expecting bad news. She bore him a son, Narfi, and shortly afterwards another son, Vali. Sometimes Loki would vanish for long periods and not return, and then Sigyn would look like she was expecting the very worst news of all, but always Loki would come back to her, looking shifty and guilty, and also as if he were very proud of himself indeed. Three times he went away, three times he eventually returned. The third time Loki returned to Asgard, Odin called Loki to him. I have dreamed a dream, said the wise old one-eyed god. You have children. I have a son, Nafi, a good boy, although I must confess that he does not always listen to his father, and another son, Vali, obedient and restrained. Not them, you have three other children, Loki. You have been sneaking off to spend your days and your nights in the land of the Frost Giants with Anger Boda, the giantess. And she has borne you three children. I have seen them in the eye of my mind as I sleep, and my visions tell me that they will be the greatest foes of the gods in the time that is to come. Loki said nothing. He tried to look ashamed and succeeded simply in looking pleased with himself. Odin called the gods to him with Tyr and Thor at their head, and he told them that they would be journeying far into Jotunheim, the giant land, to bring Loki's children to Asgard. The gods traveled into the land of the giants, battling many dangers until they reached Angerboda's keep. She was not expecting them, and she had left her children playing together in the great hall. The gods were shocked when they saw what Loki and Angerboda's children were, but that did not deter them. They seized the children and they bound them, and they carried the oldest between them, tied to the stripped trunk of a pine tree, and they muzzled the second child with a muzzle made from knotted willow, and they put a rope around its neck as a leash, whilst the third child walked beside them, gloomy but disturbing. Those on the right of the third child saw a beautiful young girl, while those on the left tried not to look at her at all, for they saw a dead girl, her skin and flesh rotted back. Have you noticed something? Thor asked Tyr on the third day of their journey back through the land of the Frost Giants. They had camped for the night in a small clearing, and Tyr was scratching the furry neck of Loki's second child with his huge right hand. What? They are not following us, the giants. Not even the creature's mother has come after us. It's as if they want us to take Loki's children out of Jotunheim. That is foolish talk, said Tyr, but as he said it, even though the fire was warm, he shivered. Two more days of hard travelling and they were in Odin's hall. These are the children of Loki, said Tyr, shortly. The first of Loki's children was tied to a pine tree and was now longer than the pine tree it was tied to. It was called Jormungandr, and it was a serpent. It has grown many feet in the days we have carried it back, said Tyr. Thor said, Careful, it can spit burning black venom. It spat its poison at me, but it missed. That's why we tied its head to the tree like that. It is a child, said Odin. It is still growing. We will send it where it can harm nobody. Odin took the serpent to the shore of the sea that lies beyond all lands, the sea that circles Midgard. And there on that shore he freed Jormungandr and watched it slither and slip beneath the waves and swim away in loops and curls. Odin watched it with his one eye until it was lost on the horizon, and he wondered if he had done the right thing. He did not know. He had done as his dreams had told him, but dreams always know more than they reveal, even to the wisest of the gods. The serpent could grow beneath the grey waters of the world ocean, grow until it encircled the earth. Folk would call Jormungandr the Mithgard Serpent. Odin returned to the Great Hall, and he ordered Loki's daughter to step forward. He stared at the girl. On the right side of her face, her cheek was pink and white. 
Her eye was the green of Loki's eyes. Her lips were full and carmine, but on the left side of her face, the skin was blotched and striated, swollen in the bruises of death. Her sightless eye rotted and pale, wizened and stretched over skull-brown teeth. What do they call you, girl? asked the Allfather. They call me Hell, she said. If it pleases you, Allfather. You are a polite child, said Odin. I'll give you that. Hell said nothing, only looked at him with her single green eye, sharp as an ice chip, and her pallid eye, dull and spoiled and dead, and he saw no fear in her. Are you alive? he asked the girl, or are you a corpse? I am only myself, Hell, daughter of Angerboda and of Loki, she said, and I like the dead best of all. They are simple things, and they talk to me with respect. The living look at me with revulsion. Odin contemplated the girl, and he remembered his dreams. Then Odin said, This child will be the ruler of the deepest of the dark places, and ruler of the dead of all of the nine worlds. She will be the queen of those poor souls who die in unworthy ways, of disease or old age, of accidents or in childbirth. Warriors who die in battle will always come to us here in Valhalla. But the dead who die in other ways will be her folk to attend to her in her darkness. For the first time since she had been taken from her mother, the girl Hel smiled with half her mouth. Odin took Hel down to the lightless world, and he showed her the immense hall in which she would receive her subjects, and watched as she named her possessions. I will call my bow hunger, said Hel. She picked up a knife. This is called famine, and my bed is called sick bed. That was two of Loki's children with Angorboda dealt with then. One in the ocean and one to the darkness beneath the earth. But what to do with the third? When they had brought the third and the smallest of Loki's children back from the land of the giants, it had been puppy-sized, and Tyr had scratched its neck and its head and played with it, removing its willow muzzle first. It was a wolf cub, grey and black, with eyes the colour of dark amber. The wolf cub ate its raw meat but it spoke as a man would speak, in the language of men and the gods, and it was proud. The little beast was called Fenrir. It too was growing fast. One day it was the size of a wolf, the next the size of a cave bear, then the size of a great elk. The gods were intimidated by it, all except Tyr. He still played with it and romped with it, and he alone fed the wolf its meat each day. And each day the beast ate more than the day before, and each day it grew and it became fiercer and stronger. Odin watched the wolf child grow with foreboding, for in his dreams the wolf had been there at the end of everything, and the last things Odin had seen in any of his dreams of the future were the topaz eyes and the sharp white teeth of Fenris Wolf. The gods had a council, and resolved at that council that they would bind Fenrir. They crafted heavy chains and shackles in the forges of the gods, and they carried the shackles to Fenrir. Here, said the gods, as if suggesting a new game. You have grown so fast, Fenrir. It is time to test your strength. We have here the heaviest chains and shackles. Do you think you can break them? I think I can, said a frighteningly large Fenris wolf. Bind me. The gods wrapped the huge chains around Fenrir and shackled his paws. He waited motionlessly whilst they did this. The gods smiled at each other as they chained the enormous wolf. No! shouted Thor. Fenrir strained and stretched the muscles of his legs and the chains snapped like dry twigs. The great wolf howled to the moon, a howl of triumph and joy. Ow! I broke your chains, he said. Do not forget this. We won't forget said the gods. The next day, Tyr went to take the wolf his meat. I broke their fetters, said Fenrir. I broke them easily. You did, said Tyr. Do you think they will test me again? I grow and I go stronger with every day. They will test you again. I would wager my right hand on it. The wolf was still growing, and the gods were in the smithies, forging a new set of chains. Each link in the chains was too heavy for a normal man to lift. The metal of the chains was the strongest metal that the gods could find. Iron from the earth mixed with iron that had fallen from the sky. They called these chains Dromi. The gods hauled the chains to where Fenrir slept. The wolf, now larger than ever, 
opened his eyes. Again? He said. If you can escape from these chains, said the gods, then your renown and your strength will be known to all the worlds. Glory will be yours. If chains like this cannot hold you, then your strength will be greater than that of any of the gods or the giants. Fenrir nodded at this, and looked at the chains called Dromi, bigger than any chains had ever been, stronger than the strongest of bonds. There is no glory without danger, said the wolf after some moments. I believe I can break these bindings. Chain mm, me up. The great wolf stretched and strained, but the chains held. The gods looked at each other, and there was the beginning of triumph in their eyes, but now the huge wolf began to twist and to writhe, to kick out his legs and strain in every muscle and every sinew. His eyes flashed, and his teeth gnashed, and his jaws foamed. He growled as he writhed, and he struggled with all his might. The gods moved back involuntarily, and it was good that they did so, for the chains fractured and then broke with such violence that the pieces were thrown far into the air, and for years to come the gods would find lumps of shattered shackles embedded in the sides of huge trees or the sides of mountains. Yes! Ow! shouted Fenrir, and howled in his victory like a wolf and like a man. The gods who had watched this struggle did not seem, the wolf observed, to delight in his victory, not even Tyr. Fenrir, Loki's child, brooded on this and on other matters, and Fenris Wolf grew hungrier and huger with every day that passed. Odin brooded, and he pondered and he thought. All the wisdom of Mimir's well was his, and the wisdom he had gained from hanging from the world tree, a sacrifice to himself. At last he called the light elf Skrinir, Frey's messenger to his side, and he described the chain known as Gleipnir. Skrinir rode his horse across the rainbow bridge to Svartalheim with instructions to the dwarves for how to create a chain unlike anything ever made before. The dwarves listened intently to Skrinir describe his commission, and they shivered, and they named their price. Skrinir agreed, as he had been instructed to do by Odin, although the dwarves' price was high. The dwarves gathered the ingredients they would need to make Gleipnir. There were six things those dwarves gathered. For firstly, the footsteps of a cat. For secondly, the beard of a woman. For thirdly, the roots of a mountain. For fourthly, the sinews of a bear. For fifthly, the breath of a fish. And for sixthly and lastly, the spittle of a bird. Each of these things was used to make Gleipnir. You say you have not seen these things. Well, of course you have not. The dwarves used them in their crafting. When the dwarves had finished their crafting, they gave Skrinir a wooden box. Inside that box was something that looked like a long silken ribbon, smooth and soft to the touch. It was almost transparent and weighed next to nothing. Skrinir rode back to Asgard with the box at his side. He arrived late in the evening, after the sun had set. He showed the gods what he had brought back from the workshop of the dwarves, and they were amazed to see it. The gods went then together to the shores of the Black Lake, and they called Fenrir by name. He came at a run, as a dog will come when it is called, and the gods marveled to see how big he was now, and how powerful. <clears throat> what is happening? asked the wolf, larger than they had ever seen it before. We have obtained the strongest bond of all, they told him. Not even you will be able to break it. The wolf puffed himself up. <clears throat> I can burst any chains, he told them proudly. Odin opened his hand to display Gleipnir, and it shimmered in the moonlight. That, said the wolf, that is nothing. The gods pulled on it to show how strong it was. We cannot break it, they told him. The wolf squinted at the silken band that they held between them, glimmering like a snail's trail or the moonlight on the waves. And he turned away, uninterested. Mm, no, he said. No, bring me real chains, real fetters, heavy ones, huge ones, and let me show you my strength. This is Gleipnir, said Odin. It is stronger than any chains or fetters. Are you scared, Fenrir? Hmm. Scared? Not at all. But what happens if I break a thin little ribbon like that? Hmm. Do you not think I will get renown and fame? That people will gather and together say, Do you know how strong and powerful Fenris Wolf is? He is so powerful he broke hmm, a silk ribbon. There will be no glory for me in breaking Gleipnir. Ha! 
You are scared, wolf, said Odin, and the great beast sniffed at the air. <sighs> I sense treachery and trickery, said the wolf, his amber eyes flashing in the moonlight. Mm, and although I think your Gleipnir may only be a ribbon, I will not consent to be tied up by it. You who broke the strongest, biggest chains there ever were. You're scared by this band, said Thor. Ah, I am scared of nothing, growled the wolf. I think it is rather that you little creatures are scared of me. Odin scratched his bearded chin. You are not stupid, Fenrir. There is no treachery here, but I understand your reluctance. It would take a brave warrior to consent to be tied up with bonds he could not break. I assure you, as the father of the gods, that if you cannot break a band like this, a veritable silken ribbon as you say, then we gods have no reason to be afraid of you, and we will set you free and let you go your own way. A long growl from the wolf. <sighs> hey, you lie, old father. You lie in the way that some folk breathe. If you were to tie me up in bonds I could not escape from, then I do not believe you would ever free me. Ah, I think you would leave me here. I think you plan to abandon and to betray me. I do not consent to have the ribbon placed on me. Fine words and brave words, said Odin. Words to cover your fear at being proved a coward, Fenris Wolf. You are afraid to be tied with this silken ribbon. No need for more explanations. The wolf's tongue lolled from his mouth, and he laughed then, showing sharp teeth, each the size of a man's arm. Ha ha ha! Rather than question my courage, I challenge you to prove there is no treachery planned. Ah, you can tie me up. If one of you will place your hand in my mouth, I will gently close my teeth upon it, but I will not bite down. Ah, if there is no treachery afoot, I will open my mouth when I have escaped the ribbon, or when you have freed me, and his hand will be unharmed. There, hey, I swear. If I have a hand in my mouth, you can tie me with your mm, ribbon. So, whose hand will it be? The gods looked at each other. Baldur looked at Thor. Heimdall looked at Odin. Honir looked at Frey, but none of them made a move. Then, Tyr, Odin's son, sighed and stepped forward and raised his right hand. I will put my hand in your mouth, Fenrir. Fenrir laid on his side, and Tyr put his right hand into Fenrir's mouth, just as he had done with Fenrir as a puppy when they had played together. Fenrir closed his teeth gently until they held Tyr's hand at the wrist without breaking the skin, and he closed his eyes. The gods bound him with Gleipnir. A shimmering snail's trail wrapped the enormous wolf, tying his legs, rendering him immobile. There, said Odin. Now, Fenris wolf, break your bonds. Show us how powerful you really are. The wolf stretched and struggled. It pushed and strained every nerve and muscle to snap the ribbon that bound it. But with every struggle, the task seemed harder and with every strain, the glimmering ribbon became stronger. At first, the gods sniggered, and then the gods chuckled. Finally, when they were certain that the beast had been immobilized and that they were no longer in danger, the gods laughed. Only Tyr was silent. He did not laugh. He could feel the sharpness of Fenris Wolf's teeth against his wrist, the wetness and warmth of his tongue against the palm of his fingers. Fenris stopped struggling. He lay there, unmoving. If the gods were going to free him, they would do it now. But the gods only laughed the harder. Thor's booming guffaws, each louder than a thunderclap, mingled with Odin's dry laughter, with Baldur's bell-like laughter. Fenrir looked at Tyr, and Tyr looked back at him, bravely. Then Tyr closed his eyes and nodded. Do it, he whispered. Fenrir bit down on Tyr's wrist, but Tyr made no sound. He simply wrapped his left hand around the stump of his right and squeezed it as hard as he could to slow the spurt of blood to an ooze. Fenrir watched the gods take one end of Gleipnir and thread it through a stone as big as a mountain and fasten it under the ground. Then he watched as they took another rock and used it to hammer the stone deeper into the ground. Deeper than the deepest ocean. Treacherous Odin, called the wolf. If you had not lied to me, I would have been a friend to the gods. But your fear has betrayed you. I will kill you, father of the gods. I will wait until the end of all things, and I will eat the sun, and I will eat the moon. But I will take the most pleasure in killing you. The gods were careful not to get within reach of Fenrir's jaws. But as they were driving the rock deeper, Fenrir twisted and snapped at them. The god nearest him with presence of mind thrust his sword into the roof of Fenris Wolf's mouth, the hilt of the sword jammed in the wolf's lower jaw. 
wedging his jaw open and preventing it from ever closing. The wolf growled inarticulately, and saliva poured from his mouth, forming a river. If you did not know it was a wolf, you might have well thought it was a small mountain, with a river flowing from a cave mouth. The gods left that place where the river of saliva flowed down into the dark lake, and they did not speak. Once they were far enough away, they laughed some more, and clapped each other on the back, and smiled the huge smiles of those who believe they have done something very clever indeed. Tyr did not smile, and he did not laugh. He bound the stump of his wrist tightly with a cloth, and he walked beside the gods back to Asgard, and he kept his own counsel. This was when the mortals came to know Tyr as the bravest of all gods, the only god that stepped up to place his hand inside the razor teeth of the wolf Fenrir, even after raising the wolf as his own. He was the boldest of gods, to be a war god with only one hand, but Tyr was that god, the god that would sacrifice himself for the greater good of Asgard.